right. Good morning. Um, first, I want to uh, thank everybody here for inviting me out. It's really an honor to be um, at the first annual meeting here. Um, I've been talking with other uh, of the NAS uh, members who are here, and, and everybody's very impressed so far. Um, your ability to pull together a multidisciplinary group and, and based on evidence is, is really fantastic. So <clears throat> I've been asked to talk a little bit about guidelines and um, evidence-based practice. Um, the idea of evidence-based practice started um, a little over 20 years ago with Sackett. Uh, he defined it as the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of the current best evidence in making decisions about the care of the individual patient. It means integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research. So when we take that into our individual practice, um, there's, there's four steps that in general that we take home as practitioners. First, we've got to ask a question. What is that question? How are we going to um, you know, take care of the patient in front of us? We need to acquire the evidence. We need to appraise the evidence, and then we need to implement that evidence. There's a couple different kinds of questions that we might ask. Foreground questions, which in general are um, getting knowledge of, of, of the subject. So um, what's the occurrence of disc herniation in 40-year-old you know, workers, um, industrial workers? Um, actually, these, are back, these definitions are, are back, backwards here. I was, uh, sorry about that. Um, the foreground questions are, um, po are typically um, PICO-based um, population intervention control and outcome. Um, in patients with lumbar disc herniation, does tubular discectomy result in better outcomes than traditional discectomy? So if, if you've got a patient in front of you and you're trying to develop an approach, you're going to develop questions which can potentially help you manage the patient in front of you. You then need to acquire the evidence that's going to help you get the answer to the question. A common way to do that is to go to PubMed and search through the literature, and you can limit that search to systematic reviews or randomized controlled trials to get the best available evidence for an individual question. Next, you would have to appraise that evidence. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the evidence-based medicine steps in the, in the entire appraisal process, but there's a lot that goes into that. Um, is, is the study you're looking at, you know, retrospective or prospective? Is, was it done at multiple centers? Is it a randomized trial? Are the patients and the people who are evaluating that um, masked? Uh, what are the inclusion and exclusion criteria? Um, what kind of statistics did they use, and what kind of outcomes did they use, which is also important. Um, and, you know, really, is this, is this study um, applicable to the patient who's sitting in front of you? What we want ultimately at the end is to have the best evidence available for us. And so this is a, an evidence period, or a pyramid, excuse me, um, in studies, primary research you can see, at least in this, or at the bottom of the pyramid, um, we've got levels of evidence there where we're, we're, we're looking at randomized controlled trials. But as we go up, data starts to become synth um, put together and synthesized, um, and ultimately we end up with evidence-based practice guidelines, which are the purple one a second from the top. And that's really helpful when you're looking at overall how do we manage patients and, and um, the, the evidence in totality. So I've been the um, on the evidence-based guidelines committee with NAS since its inception, and I've been their chairman for um, eight years, their co-chairman for eight years. And this is what we do. We develop evidence-based guidelines um, that are, are published, and most of you are aware of them. I saw one quoted earlier, which is fantastic. What we do is we ask questions that might be applicable to um, any multidisciplinary spine practitioner. The, our, our guidelines are divided up in, into surgical and non-surgical categories and imaging and rehabilitation. And we ask questions based on the subject in front of us is, is what would be helpful. We then um, review all the literature available to make the best, um, to make the best recommendations regarding care. The strength of a recommendation is based on the quality of evidence that we have. Um, and, and using this type of a process, we um, develop a guideline that provides an easy way for the provider to educate themselves on the best available evidence. When this is followed, it results in better outcomes for patients and better health care, 
um, and it can reduce the unnecessary variation between practice. And I really applaud the Saudi Spawn Society for um, implementing an evidence-based guideline in their um, goals for the future. What this ultimately is, is to the physician, though, is a huge time saver. It saves you the ability of having to go do this all by yourself. Um, and from <clears throat> an impact on your community, it's going to allow you to have uh, good, consistent care between groups. The process of guidelines is fairly complicated, as you can see on this slide. Um, you've got multiple people, consumers and stakeholders and, and physicians and all kinds of people working on this. and um, you know, it's a fairly involved process, and I'm not going to go through the entire process here, only to note that um, there's a lot that goes into doing this. And so um, Saudi, Saudi Spine Society seems to have a very good um, understanding of this and um, a dedication to um, developing guidelines that are going to be applicable to you. When we talk about that, what are the possibilities for these guidelines? Well, you can create them, which is what we do at NAS. Um, the problem is, is that uh, the, the good thing about that is we're creating custom guidelines that fit the need as we see it in is NAS as a multidisciplinary group, um, but it is time consuming, resource in intensive, um, and f for anybody who's starting in that process, it's, a, it's an extensive um, process and methodologic learning curve. Your other options um, from the Saudi Spine Society are to adopt, which is basically take existing guidelines and use them as is, or adapt. And it's um, after talking with some of the members here, that's the option that they've chosen, and it seems to be the best. Um, it takes less time than creating an original guideline. Um, you can create um, similar questions unique to the setting that you have, um, and it takes advantage of the work group, <coughs> work done by the prior group, um, and the guidelines then will, will be updated. So if you take an existing guideline, you will do a new um, literature pull from the articles that have happened since the last one, and you'll have the guideline be updated to um, the current time frame, which is fantastic. There's um, five steps that go into doing this. Um, planning, which is the phase that you're in right now. Um, and it's, it seems like you guys are well above the curve there, so it's fantastic. Um, then you take you know, you would take the existing guidelines and determine which of those, um, pri prioritize them and decide which one are you going to go after first. Um, and then as soon as you determine which guideline that would be, you'd make an, an initial assessment of the recommendations in that guideline. Once you do that, you determine which of those you'd like to modify and, uh, and adjust. Um, you pull the um, evidence to do that and go through the entire grade process. Uh, you make the modifications as, as necessary, um, publish it for the group, and then evaluate. Um, I ended a little bit early here, but uh, we can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott, for this um, excellent talk.